This is Tyler Crone. I am chair of the 36, and we are so delighted this evening to be welcoming Kathy Moore to be speaking with us about her city council race for D5. Kathy, please introduce yourself and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kathy Moore, and I use she, they pronouns, and I'm running for Seattle City Council District 5, and I'm very pleased to be here tonight to talk to you a little bit about my candidacy and answer the questions that I've received. And did you want me to begin? If, yes. And if you would love to give us your formal introduction, this would be a wonderful time. Thank you so much, Kathy. You have two minutes. Okay. Thank you. All right. As I mentioned, I am running for Seattle City Council District 5. And um, basically, I'm running because I really want to get things done. Uh, that are going to uh, improve the lives and the well-being of everyone in Seattle. Um, we are at a sort of critical juncture where our city has been um, under duress for a while and we've got some big challenges. Um, and I would really like to be in a position to bring my, my knowledge and my sort of lifelong commitment to public service to addressing uh, those issues and to leading. And, and specifically, I would like to lead on uh, the issues of public safety reform, which I think is a, a critical issue and a nuanced and complex issue. Uh, I'd also like to lead on the issue of behavioral health uh, treatment and reform and substance use disorder treatment uh, and reform to some extent, um, the issues of housing affordability, um, housing in general, but also housing affordability. We have a comprehensive plan coming up here, uh, which is a uh, you know, once in a 10 year opportunity to really uh, fashion the future of the city. And I think it's a critical time for us. And um, it's one where we can really begin to realize uh, our stated progressive values of equity and inclusion um, and making this a healthy climate friendly place to live. Um, I also want to, like to lead on the issue of transit and then D5 specific issues because um, we are local now and D5 has a lot of uh, the same challenges that the city has, but we also have our specific issues relating to our own transit, 130th Street Station, um, 140th 8th, even though that's in Shoreline. Uh, and we have a lot of critical affordable housing issues and density issues that are coming up as well. Um, and just to be uh, accessible um, and responsive to the, all of the constituents in D5 and to really try to lead with community-driven solutions. And so those are, and given that I've um, spent my life uh, doing public service, doing the hard jobs of being a public defender, a social worker, a judge, um, Peace Corps volunteer, um, it's, you know, I don't, I, I, I I don't shy away from doing that hard work because to me, ultimately, it's very valuable to see the work, the improvements that can come through doing that hard work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Jeremy, will you ask our first question? Uh, yeah, first prepared question. Um, what, st what steps will you take to ensure that the city remains safe for all, including Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQ plus people, while keeping police accountable to elected leadership and community? Thank you for that question. Um, I think really the, the first place that we begin is to, def what do we define as uh, a safe? And I think everybody to some extent has an individual definition of safety. But I think uh, we probably all agree that we do, a consensus definition is to be free from violence. And we need to look at what are the underlying causes of violence. Um, most generally, I would say an underlying cause of violence is trauma, um, poverty, a lack of access to resources, you know, the readily, easily availability of, of guns, uh, mostly fire or handguns. Um, and sort of a, a dominance culture. Um, I think we need to also um, address uh, situations where an individual as, is at an increased risk of violence. So those would be unsheltered situations, individuals in unsheltered situations, individuals who are being trafficked. trafficked. Um, substance use disorder um, certainly makes someone more vulnerable, people who are young, um, disabled, um, many in the immigrant community. So. I think it's important in looking at how we keep people safe 
to look at what are those underlying um, issues and, and um, categories. And certainly we want to um, have a police force uh, that is respectful of uh, people's constitutional rights and uh, execute their duties constitutionally and with respect uh, an understanding of the community that they serve. Um, and in that, I think we want to continue to improve crisis, uh, improve response times. Uh, it's important for people to know that um, someone's coming, but we also need to look at alternatives. We need to look at expanding our community service office program. We need to look at creating more of a civilian response program. Um, we need to continue to um, work on Excuse me. Uh, working through the uh, micro community policing plans, which will look at the needs of each community for each community talks about what their specific safety needs are. Thank, Thank you, you, Kathy. Do we have any follow up questions from the e-board? Please use your raise the hand function. Um, sorry, uh, Tyler, let's wait until the end for follow ups. OK, to make, great. Sure, to make sure we have time for all of our prepared yes. questions. Yes. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. Toby, you're going to ask question number two. Toby? How would you ensure the city has an updated climate action plan? And what specific actions would you prioritize to get us back on track to meeting Seattle's Green New Deal goals? Thank you for that question. Um, well, uh, uh, last fall, Mayor, Mayor Harrell uh, passed the 6.5 million new, new Green Deal Opportunity Act initiative. And um, I guess my position would be as a council member, it would be our responsibility to ensure that, that, that all of the actions that are outlined in that initiative actually uh, come to fruition. And so one of some of the things that he identified there was to develop uh, resilience hubs in Seattle, which is incredibly important. Uh, the whole concept of resilience uh, is really coming to the forefront now and the, the ideas of not only in climate, but also in broader uh, the broader um, challenges that are facing us uh, in our cities and our communities in general. Um, also, one thing that uh, that initiative uh, really speeds up is getting all of the city owned buildings off of fossil fuels by 2035 is certainly an aggressive goal, but uh, one that needs to happen. Um, and, and given that we've got a lot of building planned, uh, it's a uh, great opportunity to make sure that we follow through with that. Um, certainly part of this is increasing affordable housing, um, looking to create uh, climate data and a community health indicator project. Can't accomplish goals if we don't have the appropriate data. Um, and we need to make sure that we're hearing all community voices. So an important part of this initiative was the $100,000 for community engagement, um, because again, you know, certainly we have uh, heat deserts uh, in the South End that uh, has their own particular needs. Um, and you know, there's a lot of discussion about tree canopy and how do we increase that across the city. So there are lots of ways that we can work to uh, get us back on track. Thank you. The next question will be asked by Shep. Shep, over to you to ask question number three. Uh, the Move Seattle levy is set to expire at the end of 2024. The next nine year transportation levy will go before the voters in November, 2024 to begin in 2025. What investments and improvements would you prioritize for the next transportation levy? Thank you uh, for that question. Um, I guess, I think uh, uh, people who have really been paying attention to this issue would feel that we, the council uh, has kind of uh, taken its eye off the ball <laughs> with moving the Seattle moving levy and that we need to get pay closer attention to that. Um, but I think the investments that would focus on would be investments, obviously, in pedestrian and bike safety um, and, and connectivity. Um, I would certainly look at investments in um, EV charging stations um, and looking at ways um, to get more ways to increase transit 
uh, and get people out of their cars. Um, the idea of looking at a sort of 10 to 15 minute walkable neighborhood. Um, I mean, that's, that is the sort of broader structural investment and how, how do we make that happen? Um, and I would also look at um, wanting, trying to create neighborhoods where people want to walk or want to ride, ride, you know, ride their bikes or where it's easy, again, back to transit. We really have to make transit readily available uh, so that, um, because time is a commodity in our society. And if something's going to take a lot of time, people are going to opt for the thing that's easy. And so we need to make using alternative transit easy for people. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question and last prepared question is from Sherry. Over to you, Sherry. Hi. Um, I, I don't see it. Thank you. Um, the city has been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, yet our homelessness crisis has not receded. What are we doing wrong and what steps will we take to address the crisis? Thank you for that question. Um, I guess I would say that, uh, what are we doing wrong? <laughs> Well, I think uh, initially what we did wrong was that we didn't really take it seriously. I mean, we, we declared a crisis um, and yet there was really no urgency with that declaration of crisis. And I think part of that was because um, I think it was too easy to dehumanize people who are homeless. Um, and I think it's, we're only now just beginning to recognize that homeless people are our, our neighbors and our brothers and our sisters, and you know that they are human beings and that they are not at at fault uh, for the for the the situation in which they find themselves. Um, even though I think there's unfortunately a sense of pushback on that, and and that concerns me. Um, but I think, um, and also largely we did not look at it as a coordinated strategy. Um, you know every everybody thought it was Seattle's job or everybody thought it was the county's job or the other municipalities. And so I think a huge step forward was the creation of the King County Regional Homelessness Authority to bring a, a holistic integrated approach. And, and that has been, um, I think, a, a, a very important development. Unfortunately, uh, it's still Seattle that's largely funding it. I think we provide 68% of its budget um, and the county pays the rest, and the rest of the municipalities don't contribute, and yet many of their people are coming to Seattle, and they also benefit from it. So I think one of the things that we need to do is certainly get the rest of the um, municipalities to contribute their fair share. Um, I think in looking at the five-year plan that uh, the Regional Homeless Authority has put forth, that, you know, its, it's bottom line goal is we need to get people sheltered. Um, and there are a variety of ways of doing that. And their focus is really on non-congregate um, shelter. And I think that emergency housing. And so if, we're, if our immediate goal is to get people out of the situation of being unsheltered, which is not a, a humane place to be. It's a, you know, it often results in people developing mental illness or uh, struggles or drug, and, uh, drug use struggles um, that become more difficult to deal with as the longer that goes on. So we do need to get people into non-congregate settings and we can use uh, you know, emergency shelters because they are in place. But one of the things that we need to do is be respectful of people who don't wanna go there. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. I, we will, we're at time for the questions. Our first follow-up is from Toby. I see your hand first, Toby. You and mentioned... let me just jump in, Toby, one more second. These follow-up answers are supposed to be very brief, a minute or less. So back to you, Toby. Uh, you mentioned affordable housing. What is affordable housing and how do you make it happen? Um, well, Affordable housing, I would start out, I would say it's at least, it's, it's a minimum of 30% uh, AMI to 50%, even up to 80%. Uh, how do you make it happen? 
Um, I think we need to look to the federal government to give us more money. We, there's been too much uh, under, and dis, under investment and disinvestment from the federal government. Uh, we need to look at progressive revenue. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to relook at the mandatory housing authority, uh, mandatory affordable housing act, um, and uh, really take a hard look at how we can require developers to provide more housing and not just um, basically making a payment to a fund. Thank you, Kathy. Is there a next follow up from the e board? Jeremy? Jeremy, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Um, you had you had mentioned with the Move Seattle follow up. Um, um, sorry, the Move Seattle question. You had mentioned um several transit um se several transit and si bike and sidewalk projects. Is there any one like main one in particular that you really think needs to be highlighted? Um, well, from a district district five perspective, the one that needs to be highlighted is the one in Aurora. Uh, because that stretch of, of the state highway is, I think, the most deadliest uh, area in, in all of Seattle, and, and, and I think even broader than that. So um, D5, <laughs> uh, and I know that in the south end, there's, there's also, they have a very high uh, pedestrian uh, death uh, injury rate as well. Thank you, Kathy. Is there another follow-up from the board? If there's not a follow-up, oh, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, I'll ask another one if there's not one. Um, um, you had mentioned here in your intro the comprehensive plan and appreciate uh, bringing that one up. Um, is there any specific alternative that you are advocating for? Um, at this point, I'm not advocating for one particular alternative. Um, I think that we need to have all of the, all, obviously, all of the alternatives. Um, and actually, that, that um, sorry, there's so many papers here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, one thing that I uh, thought needed to be added to the comprehensive plan is to add building performance standards for buildings over to uh, 20,000 square feet. Um, I guess. At this point, if I had to pick one, I'd say alternative five, but it's it's still premature. I think we need to have that sort of studying done. Thank you. I have one tiny one, but I will give a moment to the board to see if anyone else would like to raise their hand. I will, I will use chair's privilege, Kathy, and ask you about your time as chair of the Seattle Human Rights Commission. And as the parent of a transgender child, I'm watching what's happening across the country. And I wonder if you have some ideas of what you could do at a leadership at a city level to ensure that our city is safe and inclusive and welcoming, particularly against the types of attacks we see across the country. This is very open-ended and this is just me personally. Thank you. Um, yes, and I, I just think it's it's just so horrible and distressing what's going on. Um, and I think it's an issue that we need to take leadership on. The city's done a really good job of taking leadership on reproductive health, um, but we need I don't think we've done quite as good a job on taking a leadership on the issues of transgender rights and and the right to to autonomy and to appropriate health care because they're all one and the same or interconnected. Um, I think we should uh, pass some additional legislation to uh, to recodify the right to receive necessary medical care um, uh, based on one's uh, gender identity uh, and the care that they're seeking uh, and we need to pass a resolution. Um, we need to continue to work with the LGBTQI Commission, and we need to continue to work with groups like Gender Justice, uh, who have been wonderful leaders uh, and I think can give us the guidance. But we, we need to be vocal voices for, for these sorts of attacks. Thank you so much, Kathy. We're so glad you were here with us tonight. Jeremy, could you share a little bit again, just in sum, what the next steps to expect from us will be? Um, okay, um, we probably don't need to keep recording this part. We can, um, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. We can stop yeah, thank there. you. <laughs> yeah.